Good morning. My name is Betsy, and I will be your conference facilitator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the American Axle and Manufacturing third quarter 2024 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer period. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press the star key, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press the star key, then the number two. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to Mr. David Lim, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, Mr. Lim. Thank you and good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone who is joining us on AEM's third quarter earnings call. Now, earlier this morning, we released our third quarter of 2024 earnings announcement. You can access this announcement on the investor page of our website, www.aem.com, and through the PR Newswire services. You can also find supplemental slides for this conference call on the investor page of our website as well. Now, to listen to a replay of this call, you can dial one 344 7529 replay access code 1531572. The replay will be available through November 15th. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that the matters discussed in this call may contain comments and forward-looking statements subject to risks and uncertainties which cannot be predicted or quantified which may cause future activities and results of operations to differ materially from those discussed. For additional information, we ask that you refer to our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Also, during this call, we may refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures. Information regarding these non-GAAP measures, as well as a reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to GAAP financial information is available on our website. With that, let me turn things over to AEM's Chairman and CEO, David Dowk. Thank you, David, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to discuss AEM's financial results for the third quarter of 2024. Joining me on the call today is Chris May, AEM's Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. To begin my comments, I'll review the highlights of our third quarter financial performance. Next, I'll touch on some business development news and commentary about the industry. After Chris covers the details of our financial results, we will open up the call to any questions that you all may have. So let's begin with our financial highlights. AIM's third quarter of 2024 sales were $1.5 billion. Adjusted earnings per share was $0.20 per share. Adjusted EBITDA in the third quarter was $174 million, or 11.6% of sales. And adjusted free cash flow was $75 million. AM delivered year-over-year financial performance driven by productivity and operating efficiencies, resulting in margin expansion despite lower sales versus last year. Let me provide you with some high-level perspective on what unfolded in the quarter. Overall, North American volumes for the industry were down approximately 5% from last year and 9% sequentially. In addition, Two of our largest programs are in the different stages of launch, which we continue to support. This was partially offset by year-over-year volume growth in the GM T1XX platform. Operationally, we are making positive strides, and this can be seen in our EBITDA results. The AM team remains highly focused on driving efficiency, cost, and utilization. Simply, we're managing factors that are under our control and look forward to further positive performance. Now let's talk about some business updates, which you can see on slide four of our presentation deck. We are very pleased to announce that AM was awarded business to supply an electric beam axle to a Chinese OEM. The launch is scheduled for 2025, and this win reflects our ability to combine our strong technology and experience in beam axles and electric drives. Furthermore, AM will support a well-known premium luxury performance European OEM with electric vehicle components. These two wins are examples of our capabilities in the EV market. We can provide dynamic component and sub- subsystems to full turnkey dry- e-drives and e-beam systems. Let's talk about our legacy business. We continue to gain traction with supporting ICE programs. 
Last quarter, we announced a win for a van program, and recently we have been awarded multiple ICE components for several OEMs. In our, in our view, combustion engines will be around for a long time, and as you know, this is good for AAM. In sum, AAM's comprehensive product portfolio well positions the company to support OEM's various propulsion needs. And finally, last month, we announced the sale of our India commercial vehicle axle business for a purchase price of $65 million. We anticipate this deal will close in the fourth quarter of this year. This is a highly favorable transaction for AM, and this sale allows us to strengthen our focus on light vehicle, ICE, hybrids, and full electric passenger car, pickup truck and SUV, and van applications on a global basis. In addition, it provides us additional financial flexibility. Now let's talk about the industry. AM's view is that ICE, hybrid, and EV powertrains will coexist for a very long time, particularly in the U.S. market. We have seen others adjust electric vehicle take rates down over the past year or so, which is reaffirming our view. What will drive electric vehicle adoption will be factors such as affordability, range, charging availability, and electrical infrastructure. In the near term, it appears to us the OEMs are still evaluating their future product planning strategies. This includes balancing investment spend, capacity, program profitability, and consumer preferences. This is clearly impacting electrification programs, and we are starting to see a renewed interest in ICE and hybrid platforms, including program extensions. As for our own investments, we will invest as needed to maintain our product and technology leadership across multiple propulsion systems. AM is very focused on profitable growth and achieving adequate returns. On to our financial guidance. With three quarters completed, we are adjusting our full-year sales, EBITDA, and adjusted free cash flow ranges as follows. AIM is now targeting sales of 6.1 to 6.15 billion, adjusted EBITDA of approximately 715 to 745 million, and adjusted free cash flow of approximately 200 to 220 million. The tightening reflects our latest assumption of North American industry production, and volume output of certain platforms, including those that are in launch. In addition, we continue to monitor overall industry inventories, which have been rising. We are also monitoring transaction prices, incentive spending, and overall interest rates. To conclude my remarks, and as I have communicated previously, our aim is on the future, and we will continue to drive our efforts towards securing our primary legacy business, which is substantially complete, generating strong free cash flow, which we continue to deliver, strengthening our balance sheet, we've been disciplined about paying down debt, advancing our electrification portfolio, we've demonstrated incremental wins in that space, and positioning AM for continued profitable growth. Let me now turn the call over to our Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Chris May, for the financial details. Chris? Thank you, David, and good morning to everyone. I will cover the financial details of our third quarter 2024 results with you today. And I will also refer to our earnings slide deck as part of my prepared comments. So let's go ahead and begin with sales. In the third quarter of 2024, AM sales were $1.5 billion compared to $1.55 billion in the third quarter of 2023. Slide 7 shows a walk between third quarter 2023 sales to third quarter 2024 sales. Lower volume mix and other was $23 million, driven primarily by lower customer production volumes on certain vehicle programs that we support. Metal market pass-throughs and FX decreased sales by approximately $19 million, and both were lower year-over-year year in the quarter. Now, let's move on to profitability. Gross profit was $171.3 million in the third quarter of 2024, as compared to $130.6 million in the third quarter of 2023. Adjusted EBITDA was $174.4 million in the third quarter of 2024 versus $156.8 million in the third quarter of last year. You can see the year-over-year walkdown of adjusted EBITDA on slide 8. In the quarter, lower volume mix and other reduced our adjusted EBITDA by approximately $9 million versus the prior year. R&D spend was higher year-over-year based on program requirements and timing. 
However, sequentially, it was lower by $4 million as we look to optimize our R&D expense. And lastly, but most importantly, that inflation's performance and other was favorable to adjusted EBITDA by $28 million, driven by a combination of operational improvements, cost controls, and elimination of a warranty charge in the prior year. All of these activities ultimately resulted in a stronger year-over-year margin performance on lower sales. Let me now cover SG&A. SG&A expense, including R&D, in the third quarter of 2024 was $94.6 million, or 6.3% of sales. This compares to $81.8 million, or 5.3% of sales, in the third quarter of 2023. The increase was primarily due to higher R&D and other costs. AM's R&D spending in the third quarter of 2024 was approximately $40.1 million. We will continue to support the needs of our business with the appropriate R&D spending levels. That said, we anticipate R&D expense should moderate in the coming years as we adjust our spending in this area to mirror current industry powertrain trends. Let's move on to interest and taxes. Net interest expense was $38.1 million in the third quarter of 2024 compared to $43.7 million in the third quarter of 2023, due in part to lower debt balances. In addition, we paid down approximately $50 million of principal on our 2026 senior notes in the third quarter, which we announced previously, and will continue to opportunistically pay down our debt. In the third quarter of 2024, we recorded an income tax benefit of $12.1 million compared to $2 million in the third quarter of 2023. For the full year, we now expect our adjusted effective tax rate to be approximately 25 to 30%. This reduction in overall rate versus previous estimates is primarily due to the favorable tax benefit incurred in the third quarter. We also expect cash taxes of approximately 50 to $55 million this year. Taking all these sales and cost drivers into account, our gap net income was $10 million or eight cents per share in the third quarter of 2024, compared to a net loss of 17.4 million or a loss of 15 cents per share in the third quarter of 2023. Adjusted earnings per share, which excludes the impact of items noted in our earnings press release, was $0.20 per share in the third quarter of 2024, compared to an adjusted loss of $0.11 per share for the third quarter of 2023. Let's now move to cash flow and the balance sheet. Net cash provided by operating activities for the third quarter of 2024 was $143.6 million. Capital expenditures net of proceeds from the sale of property, plant, and equipment for the third quarter of 2024 or 72.9 million. Cash payments for restructuring and acquisition related activity for the third quarter of 2024 were 3.9 million. Reflecting the impact of these activities, AEM's adjusted free cash flow was $75 million in the third quarter of 2024. From a debt leverage perspective, we ended the quarter with net debt of 2.1 billion and LTM adjusted EBITDA of $758 million, calculating a net leverage ratio of 2.8 times at September 30th. Our focus is to continue to strengthen the balance sheet by reducing debt. AAM ended the quarter with total available liquidity of approximately $1.5 billion, consisting of available cash and borrowing capacity on AAM's global credit facilities. I also want to provide some additional insight into the sale of our commercial vehicle axle operations in India that David mentioned and that we announced earlier in the third quarter. The sales price is $65 million and is expected to close before the end of the year pending regulatory approval. This operation generated approximately $156 million in sales in the last 12 months as of June 30th and approximately $10 million in adjusted EBITDA for the same period. Upon closing, This transaction will be both margin and leverage favorable to AAM. So as David said, this is a good deal for us. As for the full year outlook on slide five, we are adjusting our revenue, adjusted EBITDA, and adjusted free cash flow outlooks. For sales, our target range is at 6.1 to 6.15 billion for 2024. This sales target is based upon a North America production of approximately 1.5 million units at the midpoint. As you all know, our sales targets are based upon current customer production, production of certain key platforms, launch schedules, and the macro business environment. From an EBITDA perspective, we tightened our full year range to $715 to $745 million 
previously 705 to 755 million. Our adjusted free cash flow target is 200 to 220 million dollars, and we anticipate capex to be approximately the same as stated before at 4% of sales. Let me provide you with some additional color on our guidance. According to third-party estimates, the GM T1XX platform is forecasted at approximately 1.4 million units for the full year, which continues to represent the midpoint of our guidance range. Our implied quarterly cadence of sales and profitability also reflects the timing of the launches of two of our top programs. Some early fourth quarter customer downtime related to supply chain disruptions due to the impact of hurricanes and overall volume seasonality. Putting all this together, AM delivered year-over-year -year performance for the third quarter while effectively managing critical launches. On a year-to-date perspective, we continue to deliver year-over-year -year margin improvement. We have reduced our outstanding debt by nearly $100 million and continue to win new business. That said, thank you for your time and participation on the call today. I'm going to stop here and turn the call back over to David Lim so we can start the Q&A. David? Great. Thank you, Chris and David. We have reserved some time to take your questions. I would ask that you please limit your questions to no more than two. So at this time, please feel free to proceed with any questions you may have. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. The first question today comes from Ryan Brinkman with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Um, uh, maybe starting with uh, the comment on slide five, I see that your, uh, your outlook is predicated upon North America light vehicle production of 15.5 million. So seemingly in keeping with S&P Global Mobility's outlook for 15.48. Just wanted to check if you think there might be some downside risk to that, given that some other suppliers, Lear in particular, you know, assumed below S&P production levels in 4Q, primarily in Europe, but also in North America. I know you're less exposed to Europe. Um, some caution around some of the Stellantis programs, I think, where you might have some exposure. Uh, so what's the latest that you're seeing in terms of, you know, this evolving Detroit 3 inventory uh, correction uh, actions, you know, so far here in 4Q? Yeah, good morning, Ryan. Uh, this is Chris. I'll take that question. Yeah, our, our macro guidance is predicated upon uh, the number you referred to that you see in our press release. As you know, as we build our forecast also for the fourth quarter, we do take into consideration uh, current customer releases and production schedules that we are experiencing either in October or what we project over uh, about the next six to eight weeks. From our perspective, as you know, a couple of our large programs are going through some critical launches and those continue to monitor those volumes very closely. So they're generally down and ramping up as they go through these launches. And also from a macro perspective, you know, we do see some intermittent downtime, but we try to reflect those in our current schedule estimates and bake that into our current guidance. So between here and the end of the year, of course, the year's not over, uh, but we are looking at customer schedules and accounting for that impact that we see on the ground, not just the macro assumption. Okay, thanks. And then uh, lastly, from me, maybe just to follow up on some of your comments about the sale of the commercial vehicle axle operations in India, just wanted to check whether that includes the totality of your business in India, if anything remains. I know you were excited about some of those uh, light commercial vehicle e-beam awards there. Presumably that's sold as well. Does anything remain? And then are there other operations, um, whether commercial vehicle operations globally? I know you've got a, a small uh, business in, in the UK or Scotland, right? Um, anything else globally, maybe even beyond commercial vehicles? Was, was this something opportunistic? I mean, did somebody come to you or were you kind of thinking, uh, you know, we're looking for ways to improve our margin profile and, and, and financial leverage, and, and there could be other avenues to doing that as well. Yes, yeah, so Ryan, this is David. Um, to address your question, um, we're only selling two facilities in India of the three manufacturing facilities that we have. Uh, we're, we're selling the Pune and the Chennai facilities. We're holding on to our facility in Chakan. Uh, the Pune and Chennai facilities were dedicated to commercial vehicle applications. The Chakan facility uh, does a lot of other work for light vehicle type systems. Uh, we've just made a strategic decision as an organization to concentrate our efforts more on the light vehicle and passenger car, light truck, and SUV. 
and van side and less on the commercial vehicle space. Um, uh, clearly, it's, it helps us from a financial standpoint, improves our financial liquidity, as we talked about, and just allows us to concentrate our resources, both human capital and financial capital, um, in the light vehicle space, as I mentioned. Um, we still will maintain a large presence in India as it relates to our business and technical office there. Um, uh, so we're still committed to the Indian market, um, but at the same time, our real focus is going to be on light vehicle systems. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ray. The next question comes from John Murphy with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Uh, good, good morning, guys. Um, you know, I'm going to ask the the um, sort of the, the the obvious question about the the implied in the in the fourth quarter of about 142 million and EBITDA in the, in the uh, at the midpoint. Um, you know, Chris, I think you kind of just got into this and in, in some of the schedules and stuff. But I mean, is the bulk of this the the, the Ram HD uh, changeover and, and some downtime at, at GM trucks? Um, that's really kind of the you know the sequential you know pressure point, or, or are there other things that are that are going on? Yeah, no, I think you captured it actually with your comments. Obviously, North America production overall quarter to quarter, as you know, is is down. That impacts our component side of the business. We do have a couple of large programs in launch as they're kind of ramping up to their full volume through the back half of this year, uh, and then hopefully we'll exit into next year quite quite strong. You do have your normal seasonality, as you know, in the fourth quarter. But also, you know, I will point, the beginning of October started a little slow. There were some supply chain bumps associated with some of the weather or hurricane events that we experienced here in North America. That, that's how I would construct how you think about the fourth quarter. And, and then just a follow-up, I mean, that, that leads to two um, very different stories between the first three quarters and, and the fourth quarter on, on EBITDA margin. I mean, you're looking at something that's, you know, about 12.5%, you know, for the first three quarters and then about 10% for the fourth quarter. So as we think about 2025, um, and I'm – I doubt you want to get go there, you know, in detail. But if we think about the walk off point for uh, for 2025 numbers, is the first three quarters at this mid 12 percent EBITDA margin much more representative of how we should see thinking about sort of the the base to walk off off for for 2025? Yes, I uh, understand your question. Uh, I will start with you know we are not providing 2025 guidance here today. However, as, as you think about this year into next year, I would not use the fourth quarter as a launching pad. I think based upon all the different elements and production nuances of each and every quarter we experienced here in 2024, I think you need to look at the whole year in totality. Great. That's very, very helpful. And just, what, just one, one to clarification, you're just on the RAM HD, right? The other RAM pickups, you guys have little to no content. Is that correct? We do supply some components, but the primary driveline systems, we are on the HD platform, so the 2500 series and higher. And those inventories are tight. Okay, great. Thank you. For balance. Thanks, John. Thanks. The next question comes from Joe Spack with UBS. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Um, David, um, I, I, I know we're not going to talk about um, 25 um, but I did, you know, I did want to sort of touch on one portion that you know, I know you'll update next quarter, which which is which relates to sort of the backlog because, you know, it, it doesn't seem like maybe there's very uh, many major awards um, being awarded right now. But uh, I, I know you won some stuff um, um, that you highlighted uh, today, but you did also mention some program uh, extensions. So I think you normally consider about 100 to 200 million of attrition. Uh, if we consider both those factors, which is new awards might be a little bit constrained, but attrition is a little bit lower, from a net basis, do you expect much of a difference from what we've seen over the past few years? Yeah. Uh, well, Joe, good morning. Um, let me just say this. Uh, I'll start on the attrition side. Uh, typically, we attrit somewhere between 100 to 200 million a year. Um, this year was a little bit on the higher side. Um, you know, in, in the future, we expect it to be a little bit more on the lower side, uh, but within that range. So that's uh, point number one. Uh, point number two is, you know, we do not contemplate extensions in our new business backlog. We consider that to be the base business, but obviously that's good for our business o overall. Uh, but we are, do have several customers that are talking to us about uh, contract extensions right now, which is, like I said, positive. And then as relates to the new business side of things, as I mentioned before in previous calls, there's an air pocket kind of going through the industry right now as OEMs are re-looking at their long-range product plans, re-timing, re-scoping their programs. 
Um, AM is no different than any of the other suppliers. We'll all be impacted by that. It's just a matter of when they come forward with, with new business opportunities. The most important thing for us is we've got the majority of our current business locked up. Um, now we're talking about extensions on that business. We're still winning incremental programs, but to your point, not super large programs, but incremental programs. Uh, but we are seeing you know, new opportunities present themselves uh, that we weren't seeing in the past, couple, past year on ICE and hybrid programs, in addition to the electrification programs that we were previously quoting on. So hopefully that addresses your question. Yeah, maybe one quick follow-up, and maybe it's a definitional thing. Um, I just want to understand. Like, I understand you're not taking in sort of program extensions, but if that were to occur, your attrition would go lower, right? Because when when the program ends, is it not in that attrition number? Correct. Correct. Those programs would extend. Your attrition would drive down. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. We're on the same page then. Okay. Um, and then Chris. Um, and I think one of the things that um, investors are um, starting to sort of think about here um, um, with, uh, you know, post, post the election is, um, you know, uh, tariffs, obviously, but, but also, um, you know, steel prices. Can you just remind us what happened last time um, with some, with some of the steel actions globally and how, how that impacted you and, if at all, and, and how you uh, are protected or mitigated on that? Yeah, so our, our commodity business is it's really sort of two elements. We have pieces that are based upon the commodity element or the inputs to steel and other items that we purchase. As you know, we generally have contractual arrangements with our customers to pass up and down those commodity changes. It protects us, you know, 80 to 90 percent of those changes, and either a pass-up of additional cost or a pass-up of an additional save, depending how those commodities move. You know, as it relates to some of the other components, whether it's aluminum or steel, you know, we did experience some tariff elements back in the 2017, 18, 19 timeframe. Um, but as you know, part of our philosophy has been to buy and source uh, in the regions for which we produce, which helps mitigate some of the impact of the tariff specifically, though not completely immune to that. You know, we are a global supplier and we do source globally, but we do try to focus on that regionalization for sourcing. So that does insulate us from, from some of that activity. You know, where you did see some pressures in terms of like base prices increases because others had tariffs, you know, I think we were generally able to mitigate a lot of that through the scale of our buy and negotiations with our uh, supply base. Okay. Thank, thanks for that reminder. I appreciate it. The next question comes from Dan Levy with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for morning. taking the questions. Um, wanted to uh, ask about the uh, EBITDA bridge in the third quarter, uh, $28 million of positive performance inflation. Maybe you could just unpack some of the benefits there, uh, you know, I, I know there's a point here of $13 million of favorable warranty, but it's still, you know, even absent that, a, a pretty good result. And then maybe you could just remind us of sort of, you know, what is, you know, what is left in terms of inflation unwind benefits? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I'll, I'll take that here, Dan. This is Chris. So if you take the $28 million, you're spot on. One of the largest chunks in there was a year-over-year -year, um, $13 million item related to our warranty, which leaves us still with $15 million of sizable year-over-year -year performance. Generally speaking, that performance was split between both of our business units, meaning the driveline and the metal-forming groups. We saw you know, a very concentrated effort to continue to have, and we talked about this you know, probably each of the last four quarters, continuing to heavily focus and double down on productivity and performance enhancements in our metal form group. You're seeing those dollars flow through, uh, similar with the drive line as well. So, and it was really across the spectrum of all their cost elements. And I think this, hopefully that addresses your question for the bridge. Yeah, yes, and then just in terms of sort of any remaining low-hanging fruit on perhaps whether it's metal forming underperformance or, um, you know, other inflationary items that you're recovering on? Yeah, so let's uh, do that in reverse. In terms of the inflationary items, you know, we, we mentioned, I think it was last quarter's call, that we generally have most of our negotiations with our customers done. So from an inflationary either recovery or incurrence, I think we're pretty much set for this year. We're in a pretty good spot. 
You may recall last year a lot of that was back weighted in the fourth quarter, some of those recoveries. Uh, we've concluded that sort of here mid-year, and I think we're, we're in a really good position as a company from that perspective. As it relates to performance, you know, our expectation, we talked about this a year ago, um, is to continue to drive performance improvements, especially on our metal forming operations. We've seen sequential improvements there, uh, subject to, you know, volume puts and takes, but seen sequential improvements in metal forming. Our view, our belief is we continue to have performance enhancements uh, to drive that business into further productivity and productivity over the next couple of quarters into next year as well. So we, we expect continued performance in that group. Great. Thank you. Uh, as a follow-up, um, you know, with this environment, and I think the expectation by some that uh, the election outcome could drive a, an extended ice tail, maybe you could give us a sense of what that means for the resource outlays at American Axle. You had talked a little bit to, uh, you know, some reduction in, in R&D. You know, what does this say about the CapEx trends, et cetera? Um, is there anything on the resource outlay would be helpful? Thank you. Yeah, Dan, I would think about it this way, especially as programs could potentially be extended or additional um, vehicle platforms may be launching on ICE or, or hybrid. That, that plays very well to us. As you know, we have a strong installed capability and capacity inside of our factories uh, that will allow us then to minimize capital investment to support those programs or extensions. Uh, from an R&D perspective, as I mentioned in some of my prepared comments, we would expect some of that R&D spend to moderate um, based upon all-in on electrification development to a more balanced portfolio of which we have a very strong footing in both the ICE and hybrid applications here today. So we would see some additional benefits on the R&D side as well. So punchline benefit from an installed capacity that can support a lot of capability and production on ICE and hybrid today without a lot of new investment dollars to drive that further, and then also some benefits on the R&D side. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. Sure. The next question comes from Tom Narion with RBC. Please go ahead. All right. Thanks for taking the questions. Uh, there's two follow-ups to stuff that's already been asked. Um, the first one, I just want to confirm, if I'm looking at that Q4 implied versus Q3, um, except for the hurricane. I just want to be, be sure. So all, all these items, uh, the, the, the platforms, um, the production cuts that you already knew about, what, was this already known that the, the, you know, the dynamic, the Q4, uh, would be kind of more depressed versus Q3, I guess, except the hurricane? Um, or was there something new that's kind of changed uh, when you get, as opposed to when you gave your guidance in in, uh, in Q2. Yeah, no. What I, Tom, this is Chris. Yeah, no. What I would tell you is clearly, you know, a couple pieces to that. Uh, certainly, there's been some puts and takes with the launches on our two top programs, that being the Ram and the GM um, midsize crossover vehicle. As they've gone through launches, some of those have kind of counterbalanced between third and fourth quarter. And you know, we've seen some choppiness a little bit in terms of production schedules that we didn't experience or expect. You know, 90 days ago. We've seen that inside of the fourth quarter as well for a little bit, as well as some, what appears to be maybe some inventory management from the OEMs. But this is a pretty dynamic environment from a production standpoint. Um, it's not as crazy, I would say, as it was you know, a year or two ago, but there's still a fair amount of variability here that we continue to navigate and, and learn on a weekly basis at some level. But I think we've been doing a pretty good job managing our way through it. So. Okay, and, and then a follow-up on the tariff question. Um, Maybe you could remind us what happened in 2018-2019 on an uh, OEM exposure level. On, on one level, you're more exposed to U.S. D3 should be a benefit potentially, but then, you know, you had called out today winning business from a European luxury OEM and a Chinese OEM. So, you know, to what it, maybe you could remind us how that affected based on OEM exposure in in the the last round of this, and also how this it, it impacts your um, strategy to, you know, conquest OEM business? Does it make you favor uh, more domestic OEM uh, targets? Or, yeah, those are the questions. Thanks. So Tom, Tom, this is David Dow. Um As Chris said earlier in a, a previous response, um, you know, our policy is to buy, them, buy and build local in the regions that we serve. Uh, we're a global company, so we do have some uh, business being moved around the world, but most of the time we have it in the local region. Uh, therefore, 
we're not as impacted by the tariff implications, especially for a company our size. That was also reflective previously uh, back when other tariffs were put into place. Um, you know, yes, we had some impact, but not to the extent that you would expect a company our size to, to encounter. And again, a lot of that goes back to our policy of buy and build local. Um, so, you know, we're not showing a preference towards any, any OEM. Uh, what we're doing is managing risk, uh, being selective about what programs, what customers, what pl products we're going after uh, to make sure that we can get the proper and adequate financial returns on the business. Uh, at the same time, we're you know, managing, you know, you know you know, our, our overall profitable growth and trying to make sure that we can partner with those that we think are going to be able to not only, you know, identify the growth, but ultimately be able to deliver and sustain the growth from an OEM standpoint. Yeah. And, and Tom, this is Chris. One other consideration you mentioned, for example, our China excellent win that we talked about here today. We've announced a few other wins in that region in the past couple of quarters. Generally speaking, that product is for the local market, so it's not exported out, so it's really not a tariff issue from our uh, end OEM customer standpoint. Got it. Okay, thank you. The last question today comes from James Picarello with BNP. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Um, I've got a quick right. one on FX and commodities. And then uh, because I'm so creative, I also have a question on tariffs. Um, <laughs> FX commodities were, were a positive contributor uh, to EBITDA on the quarter. Was this driven by the peso primarily, and just how are you positioned for the fourth quarter? Should this stay, pos uh, stay positive for you? Yeah, so in terms of, um, James, this is Chris, in terms of the third quarter, we were favorable profitability-wise on commodities and FX, and that was split relatively equal. Uh, most of that did uh, relate to the peso from an FX standpoint. Look, as you know, the, the peso has been um, – uh, it's moved around quite a bit this year, right? It's been in its lows in the 16s, getting in the 17s. Now it's run up and it's kind of seeding back a little bit. Generally speaking, if you think about our exposure on the peso, we buy five to six billion uh, or consume five to six billion pesos a year. On sort of a rolling 12 month average, we're already 70 to 80 percent hedged on those from previous hedges. You get a little bit of a leeway or, or movement with the spot. So could you get a little bit of continued strength if it stays at 20 or so? from an FX rate, possibly, um, but generally, the closer you get to the current day, the more we have already hedged and, and that's closed out. Got it. That's helpful. And then, yeah, just on your, your Mexico footprint and, and the tariffs potential, we'll all have to navigate from here. If certain OEMs were to prioritize their U.S. capacity to max out full frame, full frame production, Right, depending on the tariff scenario. Just how should we consider your driveline capacity, optionality, and, and, and you know, your North America footprint? If the industry does tilt toward running U.S. plants to max utilization, do, do you guys have a similar level of lever to pull or, or not? Not necessarily. Yeah, James, this is David. I mean, I mean, clearly we're trying to drive utilization of our factories to be 85% or greater uh, at, at all times, um, just from an efficiency and performance standpoint. Um, we built in flexibility into our North American production capability between the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, that production capability um, has flexibility to a certain extent, um, but at the same time, if incremental investments are required in the U.S., that will evaluate that. Um, but we're clearly going to try to leverage the install capacity that we have to minimize capex going forward. Um, but we'll but we'll do what is necessary in order to protect our customers and their programs. Yeah. If I could just squeeze one quick one did, sure. regarding the divestitures, did you share the EBITDA impact that's yes. that's going out with the two India plants? Yes, uh, James. This is Chris. So on an LTM basis, the so last twelve months. Uh, this would be as of the second quarter, but sales are a little over 150 million. The LTM EBIT is about 10 million. Thanks. Yep. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to David Lim for any closing remarks. Great. Thank you, Betsy. And we thank all of you who have participated on this call and appreciate your interest in AEM. We certainly look forward to talking with you in the future. Thank you. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.